This lecture concludes the course by diving into quantitative phase analysis of cements. First, the standard quantification approach in the Rietveld method is extended towards samples that contain amorphous material. This we need because many cements contain a nanocrystalline phase or an amorphous phase. Then, we give a number of examples that involve anhydrous and hydrating cements, along with some practical guidelines in the end. It is very helpful to also have a look at the separate demonstration videos, in which you can follow such analysis step by step. Let's go back to the intensity equation for a powder diffraction experiment. The scale factors obtained in the refinement scale linearly with the phase volume fraction. So, if you assume that the sum of crystalline phases is 100%, then the phase weight fraction can be calculated by normalizing the product of the scale factor with Z, the number of formula units per unit cell, M, the mass per formula unit, and V, the unit cell volume, over the sum of these products over all crystalline phases. It should be noted that only relative proportions of weight fractions can be obtained if the sample contains amorphous phases, or if any additional crystalline phases were not included into the Rietveld refinement. This approximation is often used in quantitative phase analysis of Portland cements or clinker, where one would expect only small or negligible levels of amorphous phase. However, this assumption is not valid for cements containing SEMs, which are mostly amorphous, for instance, as you can see on the right-hand side. Different methods were thus developed to take into account the presence of nanocrystalline or amorphous phases. The presence of these amorphous phases can be quite easily seen in the figure on the right, where you can see this broad hump, which is indicative for amorphous phase. There are several ways to deal with amorphous content. Here we will consider three different approaches. The first one is to add a known amount of internal standard into the sample. This is called the internal standard approach. The second one is the external standard approach in which the quantification results are rescaled based on a comparison to a separately measured monitor sample, the external standard. And then finally, the third method that will be introduced is the PONCS method, which stands for partially or known known crystal structure method. This method requires separate calibration of the amorphous phase, but on the other hand, it enables the quantification of different amorphous phases, more than one, in the same sample. The most common approach is the internal standard approach. In fact, in this method, it is required to, to spike the sample with a known weight fraction, known amount of a crystalline standard. The given expression, shown here on the top, can be used to calculate the absolute phase weight fractions from the scale factors. The index S here identifies standard, WS corresponds to the crystallinity or the purity of the internal standard itself, and FS to the weight fraction of the standard that was added to the sample. Alternatively, the weight fractions can be calculated using the equation below, where the apparent weight fraction of the internal standard can then be, for instance, higher than the weighted amount, for instance, let's say 25% when we added 20% of rutile, and this indicates the presence of amorphous or unidentified crystalline material. Or the second case is that this can be equal, so 20% for 20% to the weighted amount, and this indicates that there is no or very little amorphous or unidentified materials. And then finally, the third case is that there is a lower amount of standards quantified than the amount that was weighed. And this is, of course, uh, an indication of that there is some problem in the experiment or in the data analysis procedure. The total weight fraction of all amorphous and, and or uh, unidentified components can be calculated as a difference between the sum of all the crystalline components and one. So you sum up all the crystalline components and the difference um, with 100% is the amorphous phase fraction. The internal standard method requires appropriate sample preparation. For instance, to, it is very important to homogeneously mix the standard into the sample. 
If the sample and standard are ground together, then one should take care that there is no overgrinding of the sample by co-grinding with a harder standard material. Overgrinding, for instance, would lead to peak broadening, broadening and partial amorphization, creation of amorphous content, by destroying softer phases by the harder ones. Especially hydrated phases in cement paste are vulnerable to this kind of decomposition. Not only by grinding, but also by dehydration and carbonation, one would, make, would really change the hydrate assemblage and one would not measure the original content of the hydrated sample. Another property is that the internal standard should be of known crystallinity. This actually means that its amorphous content should be known and should not be present in the sample. Preferably, a standard material should have a high crystal structure symmetry and have peaks that do not overlap with the main reflection peaks of the phases present in the material. And in addition, it's also good if there's no microabsorption problems that would occur, for instance, if there's a large X-ray absorption contrast between the phases in your sample and the standard. If this would be the case, then microabsorption uh, problems may occur and one would have a falsified or a biased uh, quantification. The obtainable accuracy of the quantification of the amorphous and un unknown phases strongly depends on the amount of internal standard added. Small quantities of amorphous phase of a few percent are therefore very difficult to quantify precisely, while higher levels can be quantified with greater accuracy. For hydrating cements that may contain between about 30 and 60 percent of amorphous or nanocrystalline phases, a good compromise between accuracy on both amorphous and crystalline phases would be to use additions of internal standard of around 28 percent. As it has been demonstrated that the presence of a significant amount of internal standard inside a hydrating paste itself changes the kinetics of the hydration by a filler effect, it is therefore best not to include the standard in the sample and instead to include the sample or add the sample after stopping the hydration. In mixing the sample into the hydrated material, you should be very careful not to alter the hydration products and therefore the mixing operation should be thorough but gentle and sample exposure to air should be as limited as much as possible. Since this can be quite tedious to do in practice, perhaps the less labor-intensive external standard method is preferable for routine analysis. In the external standard approach, phase quantification is carried out through the comparison of the phase scale factors of a sample to the scale factor of a well-characterized standard material measured under identical diffract diffractometer measuring conditions. In this procedure, also the different mass absorption coefficients of the sample, mu m, and the standard, mu s, need to be taken into account. As can be seen in the expression given here, the w s, the weight fraction of the standard phase in the external standard material, is also to be known. Although the obvious advantage of the method, of this external standard method, is that the sample does not need to be intermixed with an internal standard and it does avoid um, sample preparation and homogenization problems. This approach needs to, does demand the mass absorption coefficient of the sample to be known. In the most practical of ways, it is obtained by calculating the mass absorption coefficient for the used X-ray wavelength for the chemical composition. This can be seen, for instance, in the table here, where for each oxide from the chemical composition, one has the MAC, the mass absorption coefficient, given for copper K alpha radiation. The linear combination of the mass absorption coefficients with the mass fractions will enable you to measure the mass absorption coefficient of the sample. In the table, one can see the calculation done for a white cement which was not hydrated, which comes to a MAC of about 101.5 square centimeters per gram. One can also see 
how it's calculated for a slag. As a slag contains less calcium, which is a actually absorbing uh, compound because it's heavier than, for instance, silicon, one can see that here the total mass absorption coefficient is lower in the slag than for the white cement. For a hydrated white cement, for instance, on the shown in the last column, one can see that as next to the cement content, there's also water in there. So calculating the mass absorption coefficient of the total mix will show that the, the for a hydrated mix, the mass absorption coefficient is quite a lot lower. A promising development is a so-called PONCS method, which stands for partial or no known crystal structure approach. This method takes into account the contribution of a phase that has no or no known crystal structure by calibration of a phase constant, which is the shown below. This phase constant can then be used in combination with the refined scale factor to calculate the phase weight fraction in unknown mixes. This method was recently applied to the quantification of the degree of reaction of metakaline in alkali activated systems, but also to the quantification of CSH by XID in, in the early hydration of Alite. The precision and accuracy of the PUNCS method was tested by making model mixes of cement and SCMs, as for instance shown in this graph. Here a mix of 40% Portland cement and 60% slag is shown. One can clearly see the crystalline phases in green from the cement and the slag contribution in black in the X-ray diffraction pattern. The weighed in amount here is 60%. By calibrating separately the slag and calibrating the phase constant for the slag and using it in a PONCS method approach, one can actually measure directly the amount of this slag in the sample. As you can see on the right hand side, the results were very good. We measured using the PONCS method about 58.2% of slag while we weighed in about 59%. So, in general, for mixes in which the SCMs were the only unknown amorphous comp component next to a number of crystalline phases, an excellent precision is obtained of around 1 per weight percent and the accuracy over a large number of samples was about 2 to 3 weight percent. In more complex mixes, the errors and detection limits are expected to be larger. A particular difficulty in decomposing hydrated systems is acquiring a suitable model for the CSH phase. In the figure shown here, um, you can see a white Portland cement hydrated for seven years that was mixed with a known amount of metakaolin. You can see, you can recognize some of the crystalline phases present in the hydrated Portland cement, such as Ettringite or Portlandite, and you can see also in green a contribution by the CSH phase and in yellow a contribution by metakaolin. Again, when we did the analysis by PONCS, the accuracy and precision were very good. This was mainly because the CSH was the only amorphous phase in the hydrating cement and we could construct a CSH peak model that fitted nicely and could be used to decompose also model mixes, so meaning the hydrated cement with a known amount of slag or metakaolin and so on and so forth. However, the situation unfortunately becomes more complex when we have different kinds of CSH formed in blended cements of different composition. And therefore the peak profiles start to change or there is the presence of other amorphous phases that can actually limit or bias the quantification. In blends, however, so synthetic blends, the method can be used very well, as shown in the figure here. Whether is an excellent correlation of the weighted amount of SEM on the x-axis and the measured amount by Pong's analysis on the y-axis. This may be very useful, for instance, in process control, in the production of uh, ternary or quaternary blended cements, where one needs to check whether the mixing has been done correctly. Traditional XRD quantitative phase analysis methods were based on single peak heights or on 
single peak integrated heights and one compared these heights to the height of an internal standard. This has not been very successful for cement. Why, and this has been introduced before, this is because there is a high degree of overlap between the main peaks of the major phases. And this gives significant problems and significant error when applying such simple methods. There were a number of additional problems such as variability in composition and crystal structure, such as the presence of polymorphs, that could actually cause significant variations in peak positions and also intensities. For instance, in the case of Portland cements, one knows that there is a lot of solid solution, substitution, of minor elements, such as alkalis or magnesium or sulfate, in the major phases. And this is common, and it leads often to the stabilization of different polymorphs, which is then difficult to relate to a certain quantity. Therefore, the development of whole powder fitting methods, such as the Rietveld method, has enabled to largely overcome most of these peak overlap problems and it has found such widespread application. Since the phase composition, such as the alite content, can be related to properties such as strength development or durability, these kind of XRD analysis by the Rietveld method have found really a lot of use in both cement research and production quality control. For instance, this figure shown here shows a monitoring of A-Lite, B-Lite and free lime contents by XRD during a period of Portland cement production at an industrial site. And here you can clearly see that at some point there was um, some, for instance, temperature lowering in the kiln and we can see a drop in A-Lite levels, free lime coming up and B-Lite increasing as well. A step-by-step -step demonstration of phase quantification of an anhydrous cement will be shown in one of the demonstration videos. As we already did identification of the cement, now we need to import the structure for each phases. First, import and set the phases for refinement. Import structure for 63S. Let's change the name. For each phase, the scale factor, unit scale and profile should be refined. Constraints of 1% of vibration on the unit scale were applied to secure refinement. Limits of 0.0001 to 0.2 to the profile W was applied. The application of our constraints to the refined parameters will improve the stability of the overall refinement when especially we are analyzing complex samples such as the hydrated cement. Do the same steps for the rest phases, for example the C2S, C3S and C4F, as well as some other minor phases. Herein, we keep the two most common existed polymorphs for C3A, namely the cubic and orthorhombic ones. Alternatively, if you already have an HPF file with all the phases, you can also copy the phases from one HPF file to another. Right-click the phase, copy to the new HPF file you need. When we set all the limits and the parameters to be refined in the template, in the template's HPF file, previously using the same steps, check the check all the parameters for the phases. Secondly, set the global parameters, the specimen displacement, background function are usually refined. For the background functions, the polynomial function with five coefficients were used. We use the manual mode for refinement as all the refinement parameters were set manually. After all the parameters were set, the refinement can be executed by pressing the refine button here. After the first run, we can see that there is no much cubic C3A in the cement. Now we can kick it out for further refinement. As we have so many phases in cement, it takes several runs to reach the global minimum for the refinement. Open the additional graphics for the difference plot to visually check the fitting. The most common mismatching is from the cloud of the peaks around 32 degrees. In this range, we have the main peaks for C3S and of course some other peaks which were overlapped. 
The mismatch is mainly because of the preferred orientation of C3S here. We can find out the direction by pointing the mouse onto the peak, which is not well fitted. Here is the 6, the Romander 6 plane for M3 A Knight. To set the preferred orientation, you can check, you can click on C3S in refined control, then in the object inspector for C3S, you will find the item called preferred orientation. The match dollars model is recommended. Specify the direction HKF, HKL of the plane for the preferred orientation. After setting the direction, check the refine for the match dollars factor. Similar to the other parameters, we put the limit for the refinement of uh, 0.721. The value 1 means there is no uh, preferred orientation at all. The smaller is the more preferred orientation. In most of the cases, 0.7 should be uh, lower enough. If the value is too small, which means the sampling is not well done. A repetition of the XRD pattern uh, collection with more attention on reducing the preferred orientation in this case is recommended. By refining, the refitting of this peak is much improved. A larger face can be easily preferred orientated is uh, 100. Do the same for the preferred orientation of 100 for the for the 200 direction. Refine. There is some improvement for the goodness of fitting and the weighted R profile. The RWP value is now 6.9467, showing in additional graphics. By pressing the button with percentage, you will have the quantitative data output in TXT file in the default High score, high score folder. Load. Here we don't consider amorphous content in a hydro cement as uh, it is the same one which with no amorphous SMs blended. If we spike in the flash with a lower amount of standard, we will be able to determine the amorphous content based on the spiked and refined amount of the standard. Here we mix 15% of uh, Lutel with a flash. Open the scan, then insert the faces we need, namely the moonlight, quartz in the flash, and the and Lutel, which is the standard we mixed. Set all the parameters need to be refined for the faces, skill factor, unit seal, and the profile. Then set the global variables, specimen displacement. For the background, we need to change the method to use available background, then manually determine it. Let's change the scale of the y-axis to log scale to see more details on the background. By adapting the granularity or blending factor, we can get the background function following the trend of the XRD patterns. Make sure that the background should, should never go into the peaks. When satisfied with the background function, we can accept the background. Now execute the refinement. The overall fitting is quite good. When checking in details, we can see there are some peaks which is not well fitted. For example, the peak at 27.4 degrees. The main peak for Rutile. When placing the mouse onto the peak, it shows the HKL of the corresponding peaks for the face. Here is the 110 plane for Rutile. Actually, this is a preferred orientation of the Rutile. When the preferred orientation is set, set the match tolerance factor to refine. Now the refinement is done with an RWP value about 5.8%, which is very good. To show the results in internal standard, go to Customize, Fitting Retrieval Panel, change the show which percentage to as received. Here we have three options. Normal refers to the default retrieval output, as received means the renormalized internal standard result. Finally, the external key factor corrected means the results based on external standard. The last step is to specify how much internal standard we added. Choose root tile in the refinement control, locate general face information. There, are, there we have the item called standard weight percentage. Type the actual weight amount. Here is 48.1 as a crystallinity of the 
of the root tile we use is 196.2. Now the final results are shown in the analyzed view window. Export the data using the weight percentage button, or simply note it down. The basic for external standard is that the key factor can be determined using the external standard, measured under the same condition. Then the absolute content of the crystalline faces can be calculated using the key factor method. For case of the external standard method, you will need two XRD patterns, one for the sample and another for the standard. And we also need to know the chemical comparison for the sample to compute the mass absorption coefficient, the MAC value. The calculation was provided in the template file. Step 1. Refine the flat ice pattern. Open the scan for flash, insert the faces, namely the cores, the moonlight. Change the name of the faces. Manually determine the background. Make sure the background is following the lowest points of the pattern, but should not go into the peaks. Change the background function from polynomial to user variable. For simple root field refinement, system with few faces, we can start with the automatic root field refinement by clicking on the default root field. The automatic root field will refine the scale, unit scale, and the profile step by step. After several rounds of automatic refinement, then change the refinement to manual mode to further refine the pattern. Take a look at the peak at 16.5 degrees. The unfitted peak is because of the preferred orientation of cores at 10 minus 1 plane. Set the direction of the preferred orientation and set for refinement. Also, add limits for the preferred orientation. Then execute the refine, save the, save the HPF file. Step 2. Calculate the key factor using the standard scan. Create a new file, then insert the Zutile scan. There is only one, one face in the Zutile, insert the face. The standard scan is quite a simple scan to refine, so the automatic root view refinement is enough. Several rounds of the default root view refinement is recommended to get the global minimum. After refinement, save the HPF file under the same folder as a sample we analyzed. You may notice that I didn't refine the preferred orientation for the root tile. The standard was pressed on purpose to have some preferred orientation to compensate the amorphous content in the standard. The root tile we used contained 3.8% amorphous content. The deliberately introduced preferred orientation results in a key factor with 100% of crystalline root tile. To present the external standard results, go to Customize, Program Settings, Fitting root field Panel, then you will have three choices to show the weight percentage, Normal, as received or external key factor corrected. Take the external key factor corrected for the external standard method. Here, the three choices are Normal refers to the Default root field output by normalizing all the crystalline phases to 100%. As received means the renormalized internal standard results by taking out the standard. Finally, the external key factor corrected means the results based on external standard. Now we have amorphous content shown in the analyzed view window. The, v, the value is strange now as the key factor is not updated yet. We can check the key factor in customize, default, external standard. The key factor is a global parameter for the high school plus, which means we have to update it whenever the value is changed. Another place to find out the value of the key factor is here. Click on the face root tile in object inspector. You can find the derived data where the key factor located for this standard. The key factor is 79.28. Click, right click on the key factor and then choose take current key factor as standard. Now you should see 0% of amorphous for the standard, which means the key factor is the right one. Step 3. Update the Mac for the flash. After updating the key factor, go back to the flash scan. There is a value for the amorphous content. But the value is, va is not valid 
because of Mac value here is not updated yet. Click on the global variables in the object inspector, find the custom mixture Mac under agreement indices. Change the value to the calculated one using XRF results. Here is the XL used to calculate the Mac for cement related materials. You can also calculate the Mac using the high score plus Mac calculator in the tools menu. In the Mac calculator, you can find all the Mac values you need. The fundamental behind is the same. Update the Mac to 39.91 for the flash. Now the amorphous content is correct. Next to analyzing an anhydrous cements, of course, also time series of hydrating cements can be analyzed. Here, the figure shows a 3D stack of XLD measurements of a hydrating zeolite zeolite blended cements. You can clearly see the formation of cement hydrates such as atringite and portlandite while clinke phases and clinoptilolite zeolite are being consumed. Processing these data by retort analysis gives you quantitative results on the consumption and formation of the solid phases. And these data can then be used on its turn as input for hydration models or to establish reaction mechanisms. The video demonstration will show you a step-by-step -step phase quantification of a hydrated cement. It's advised to have a look at this, as this will show you the major difficulties and the major steps to be taken in a hydrated cement. The hydrated cement is much more complex compared to the unhydrated cement. The existence of nano crystalline SH the main hydrates of cement is the first challenge for the quantitative analysis. In most of the hydrated cement or blended cement, there are some there are also some minor phases which bring more difficulties for the refractory analysis. As the existence of the morphous phases, here is the nanon crystal search. In the samples, the quantification, the quantitative analysis of hydrated cement needs to be done with the internal standard or external standard method. The retrieval analysis for hydrates is based on the analyze of the hybrid cement. Open the analyzed HPF file for the hydrate cement, remove the scan for the hydrate cement, then insert the scan for hydrate cement. For the refinement, the refinement will be constrained within the range of 7 degrees to the end. Go to analyze menu Fitting, edit excluded regions, create a new exclude region from 0 to 7 degrees. In this file, we already have all the clinker phases, so we need the phases for the hydrates, namely the portendite, etrangite, etc. We can import a phase directed from the save files, or we can copy the phases we need from the templates where we already have the phases. The reason we use uh, refined phases from the same cement is that all the clinker phases will be constrained using the same cell parameters and profile. Only the scale factor will be refined in the hydrated cement. By applying such constraints, the refinement of the hydrated cement is more stable as the large number of uh, phases presented. Specifically, all the preferred orientation of the clinker phases should be removed and set to default one, remove the refine flag for the other clinker faces, namely the unit seal profile. The hydrate will be dissolved quickly with the, within the first day, so we also remove it. Right click any space in the refine control, collapse root nodes. For the hydrates, namely the portendite, we refine the unit seal profile as well as the scale factor first. We will do the final check of the refinement of the portendite by refining the preferred orientation. Similar rules will be applied to the etron guide. As you can see, the polynomial function is not powerful enough to fit the white hump from the CSH contribution in the hydrogen cement. So we change the background function to the manual determined one, click the global variable, then background, change the type of background function in the object inspector from polynomial to use available background. In this way, we can define the background function by ourselves using the determined background. By changing the 
granularity and bending factors, we should have a background curve following the lowest background of the pattern. Refine again, you should get a much better fitting of the pattern. Let's refine the preferred or orientation of the of the potent diet. Now the fitting is much better, except the cluster of peaks are at around 29 degrees. We will deal with this later, as it is mainly from the CSH nanocrystalline hump. Overall, the manually determined background works for the hydrates. After refinement of the pattern, we can output the result. There are two steps. Update the MAC value for the sample. Update the key factor. Find out the calculated MAC for the hydrate cement. Here is 17.2.03. In high school plus, click on the global variable. We'll show you the object inspector. In agreement indices, you can find the item called custom mixer MAC. Update the value to the calculated one. Here is the 17.2.03. The key factor was obtained using the scan of Zootel under the same condition as the sample scan within the same day. Insert the Zootel scan, copy the face Zootel to the Zootel scan, then execute the profile fit default retrieval twice. Now you should be able to see the amorphous content. Update key factor will update the key factor in the system, showing you an amorphous and zero amorphous for the standard, which means that you have the correct key factor for this measurement. To export the result, we should active the sample scan by double clicking the scan in the scan list, and then click the button with percentage external standard. This is a customized exporting button. You can find the way to configure the button in the help files Otherwise, simply note down the values showing the fitted window. Let's make a duplicate of the defined scan and label it as CSH PC 29 days. This is a technique to optimize the fitting of the fitting for CSH hump. Instead of using the manual background, we can introduce a profile for CSH. The profile was obtained by fitting what cement hydrated for seven years using the 40 angstrom topomorphic structure. The extracted profile only contributes to the background fitting without quantitative analysis, without quantitative information. We will only refine the scale factor of the extracted profile for CSH, but keep all the other parameters constant, as in general most of the CSH hump are similar. The background function can be simplified to the polynomial one when the CSH profile was employed. Let's change it here. Three parameters for the background, the flat uh, background function, one over x background and coefficient one will be sufficient enough to give us a good fit. If, if flat, you can add more coefficients into the background function. Let's refine again. Now the RWP file decreased and the fitting is much better especially the fitting around 29 degrees with where, where the CSH hump was located. Check the key factor and the MAC, make sure they are correct. Then we export the result. Here is a summary of the results for the hydrate sample using different background method. The result from CSH background is better as the, the improved fitting. There are no much differences in the potent content the main differences are those faces present peaks close to the CSH hump. For powdered hydration stopped samples, um, it's a little bit different. So here I will show another example with uh, the powdered sample. There are no much difference in the refined procedures for the patterns obtained on the hydra hydration stopped powder. There are three aspects need to be addressed when analyzing hydration stopped powders. First, per pre potential combination of the samples. Second, preferred orientation. Third, the normalization of the results. We save the previous analyze based on the fresh disk as a template. Then remove the scans in the HPF file. Thus, there are only the faces and the refined parameters left. Actually, this is the way how we made the templates for the analyze which will reduce a lot of work to import the 
to import and set the parameters for refinement. Insert the scan, then refine. You can see some unmatched peaks around 10 degrees. According to the identification we made before, this is a peak of a monosophy, monosopher luminate. Copy the face, here is the quartz light from the template. Further refine the pattern with quartz light. The fitting is much improved. The preferred orientation of the potent light in the powdered sample is much severe compared to the fresh disk. This is mainly because of the uh, sampling procedure when we are doing powder samples. There are also some preferred orientation for the etching light phase. Find out their plane. It's 100. Set the match donor's direction to 100 for this phase and then refine it. Calculate the key factor of the measurement and update it. Update the MAC value for the dried paste. The MAC value of the dried paste should be should also be updated by taking the removal of the free water in the sample. Uh, generally, you need a result from TGA to back calculate this, the, the, the updated MAC value. They need the previous output TXT file, then output results. The dried basis should be converted into the fresh paste or a hydrous paste for comparison. The bound water from TGA results will be needed to finalize the conversion. Alternatively, you can directly measure the free, the free water content to finalize the calculation. A calculation templates using the TGA bound water were provided in the template. The end. Overall, one could con conclude that quantitative phase analysis of hydrate suspense is not so straightforward. And it's quite important to say that XRD data of complex systems should actually not be analyzed by black box approaches. Experience has shown that quantitative phase analysis and the accuracy of the results, even for simple systems, depends really a lot on the strategy of analysis and also the skill and experience of the analyzer, the analyst. You should try to have at least a basic understanding of the underlying crystallography and of course also of the cement chemistry to be able to guide the Rietveld refinement and to judge whether the quality of the results is fine. You can actually gain some of this practical experience by practicing on simple model mixtures that you make yourself and you can also follow some trainings from more experienced researchers in your group or of other groups. So a Rietveld quantitative phase analysis can be subdivided at least into two parts. So as we discussed, there's this qualitative phase analysis part in which we identify which phases are present and we select the crystal structures that are most suited for the quantitative phase analysis that come next. So the second step is the quantitative phase analysis where we do the data fitting of the whole powder pattern to a calculated pattern. So as general guidelines, we could say that it's very good to start with good literate structure models. And we have supplied in the database a number of supplemental, supplementary materials, um, a folder which contains crystallographic information files from which you can extract the information you need to run a Rietveld analysis. So it's very useful to have a look at these because you can find a lot of different entries in the literature databases and they may be more or less applicable to cement um, systems. So we already made some sort of a pre-selection for you, on which you from which you can start and do your analysis. What is quite important as well is that at least initially, but also it's best to do this over the whole analysis, Rietveld analysis, is that you minimize the number of refined variables. Why? Well, there's often already 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 different variables that are being fitted in a Rietveld refinement. And there's not that much information that it can be completely left unconstrained. Of course, once you have selected a number of param parameters that should be varied, you should, in the final step of your refinement, refine them all together so you come to your final optimized results. So basically it means that you have 
optimize all the variables and you have at least um, obtained a sort of stable global solution. So it's quite important that for quantitative phase analysis that at least in the first steps you refine only scale factors and lattice parameters. And then later on you can include other corrections, perhaps like preferred orientation correction. Also, it's quite important that for lattice parameters, you constrain parameter variation within a sensible interval. As discussed before, one can vary lattice parameters to a large extent, or the program could do that. And then you might op end up with uh, crystal structures which are just chemically unreasonable. Bond lengths may be stretched uh, while you are changing too much while you are changing or allowing to change lattice parameters to vary. Also, it's important to check the fit and the contributions of the different individual phases visually. Why? Because then you would see what a certain parameter or change in a certain parameter is really doing in the fitting, whether, for instance, then a small contribution of a minor phase is really significant, whether it's really there or whether it's just a misfit of another phase. And also a good hint is to, when you have imposed these, let's say, intervals, for instance, for lattice parameters, you could say, well, it may vary about 1% or 2% from the literature data, that when you do the refinement, when you run the refinement and you check for parameters that, that hit these limits that you have just pre-imposed, that actually there uh, you might have indication for some problems. Maybe there's another phase. Maybe there's a problem with your crystal structure model that you selected. Or there can be other stuff. So this table gives you some sort of an overview of what you can vary during a refinement. So basically we start with phase scale factors, unit cell parameters, peak shape parameters and microstructural parameters and if needed, preferred orientation parameters. Of course, next to the phase-dependent parameters, also the so-called global parameters need to be defined, such as a specimen's displacement correction and coefficients of the background function. In complex systems such as cement, the refinement of crystal structure parameters such as atomic positions and displacement factors should best be avoided. The crystal structure refinement by the Rietveld method should best be reserved just to pure systems. The order in which the parameters are varied generally depends on the distance to their final var values, the so-called parameter shifts. But overall, it is suggested that you first start with global parameters to be refined and then phase-dependent parameters. In case of hydrating cements, the amounts of solids vary during the bundling of water into the hydration products. Therefore, a final uh, step in the quantification should be to rescale the results to a common basis such as the initial clinker content or the cement content, to enable an easy comparison and a straightforward comparison between different times of reaction. This is also called the dilution effect, actually. On the figure here, you can see how, for instance, over time, the amount of solids increases. Now, when you remove the free water by hydration stoppage, you should, of course, account for this effect and let's say that, for instance, 10% in the anhydrous cement would not be the same as 10% on the final solid in the uh, hydrated cement. This is especially and particularly important for the calculation of the degree of hydration, where you would always need to, of course, refer to the same kind of basis, because 10% of alite in the initial system could be different than 10% of alite in the final system. The formula given on the right side here gives you a way of how to correct this Portland cement. Some of the recalculation formula show um, that it actually depends, they depend on whether free water is removed to stop the hydration reactions. If the sample is assumed to be undried and cut as fresh slice, then the cor correction factor should contain the water to cement ratio of the fa phase. So what you initially put as water into the cement. If the sample is dried, a separate measurement of the bound water content on ignited basis, by measured for instance by thermogravimetry, is needed to rescale the results. 
The given expressions here uh, are developed for the case of an undried, fresh hydrated sample and for a dried hydrated sample. And you can use that thus for your uh, recalculation.